Um, I was fortunate enough in this trading cup to place seventh in the overall ranking and first in the student <laughs> ranking. So before we start, I just really like to say thank you, a very big thank you to the three of our mentors, Avi, Ken, and Matt, for really generously imparting with us all of their knowledge about stocks, about Elliot, and really taking the time, even though they're busy with fund management, you know, it's they're trading local markets, global markets, and they still take the time to publish um, DCS trade opportunities. They still take the time to publish content for all of us. So, you know, we here at Open Journal really blessed to have you guys behind us in our trading journey. So, can we give them a round of applause? And also to the whole Investigrams team for making all of this possible. You know, I don't think I'd be trading today if not for your easy to access platform. So thank you guys. We to give them also a round of applause. Aside from being a part of Open Journal, I was I'm also blessed that I get to learn from Sir Jet, Sir Spyfrat, and Sir Jojo at the UH. And one of the things that they teach us that they really try to ingrain into our minds at the UH is that stock selection is more important than market timing. That what stock you buy is more important than where you buy the stock. Because if you just get your stock selection right and you're able to narrow down your investment universe into a list of trades that have the qualities of what it takes to become a super performer, then you automatically increase the likelihood that what you pick can become a big winner. And they say even that if you just pick the right stock, even if even if your market timing isn't that great, that your stock will forgive you as long as you pick the stock with the right qualities. And what they also try to teach us is that you should always focus on the relevant trades. That you have a stock selection criteria that allows you to identify and trade what the market is telling you to trade so that those stocks are the ones with the volume, the stocks that are leading the market. And to use a multi-factor approach in selecting opportunities. And just as how it's important to have a solid market timing system that allows you, that tells you when to enter and where to exit a stock, it's also as important to have a solid stock selection process that gives you, that tells you um, what type of qualities that you're supposed to be looking for in the stock that you choose. And have you guys noticed that for the past three years, the 2017, 2018, and 2019 trading cup? The top 10 participants, sila Javi, sila Ken, Z Freaks, Boomi, they all use different market timing systems. They all use different systems. Sir Javi and Ken, they use the DCS or Elliott paired with classical technical analysis. Boomi has his own price action trading setup. Z Freaks uses Darvas and RSI. I'm sure the, the top one last year's Paul Code uses Bollinger Bands. The point I'm trying to make is that all of them have different entry systems. They have different market timing systems. But one thing that's common among all of them is that they traded the same stocks. 2017 it was PXP, MAC, IMI, Tox. 2018 it was ISM, C, now. And I haven't seen the other presentations, but then I'm guessing now in 2019 it's ASX, KPPI, Sun, maybe the volatility in MWC and MPI. And that just gives us more belief, it just gives us more conviction on our idea that stock selection is more important than market timing. So with that, it's important to have a multi-factor approach in stock selection. The first is that you factor stocks based on momentum, volume, and volatility. Momentum, when the market's in momentum, when the market's going up, that you're able to filter down your list of stocks into the leaders based on relative strength. So you're automatically filter, right, filtering the stocks that have the capabilities of being super performers, right? Because the way here at Open Journal, what we're trying to capture is stocks that are in wave three of three. And the way when a stock is in wave three of three, it's in the strongest part of its trend, peak acceleration. And when a stock is in the strongest part of its trend, I think it's going to be stronger than the rest of stocks in the investment universe. But so when you filter down stocks, so maybe the top five, top ten strongest stocks in the market, 
you're automatically filtering for stocks that have the potential of being in wave three. But in volume, more than 100 million value traded over the past 10 days for normal stocks. But it's zero if you're gonna trade the volatility in micro caps, 20, 50 million, more than 50 million. Above average volume to tell you what the market is participating in. Volatility, low volatility depends on your personality. Low volatility when trend following, depend on And high volatility when trading laggards. Because at BOH, we're taught also that the only thing that makes a laggard tradable, like tech, MPI, and the reason, is its volatility. It's the only thing that makes it tradable. So that's my stock selection process, that I filter stocks based on those three factors, depending on what I'm trying to capture. The market's going up, relative strength. If the, market, the market's going down, everything that you see is falling down, then I'm trying to capture the volatility. And my last part of the process is really my Elliott count. If tama yung count ko. Because what I like about Elliott Wave is that if you have the right count, it gives you a roadmap as to what is possible for the stock, where the turns are going to be. And siguro, what I like to do is to focus on the relevant trades and I want to buy it at the right time. So that's before it moves, maybe a little bit before it moves or as it's already moving. And Elliot, it gives you, it tells you where where you're gonna where you're gonna expect a move to turn, or where you're gonna expect it to, when you're gonna expect it to turn. So that's the so I filter stocks based on those three factors, and then my last filter is my Elliot count. Tell me also what to prioritize in my trade. So next is my market time system. So my market time system, the buying strategies is more or less the same with everyone here. I use the DCS and I use the intraday bull dip plus failure swing. Bevemon bounce, um, for those of you who don't know what the Bevemon bounce is, it's just a 50 period moving average with a small standard deviation. Right? Pattern breakout, maybe box, maybe uh, falling wedge or an M MOC, mark on close. A mark on close is when a stock, let's say at 3.15 pre-close, let's say Ayala land. 3.15 pre-close, it's at 48. And then it's automatically forced down during the close by um, certain brokers. And let's say 3.15 pre-close, it's at 48. And it closes 3.20 at 47. That's a mark on close. And it has a chance on the next day that it will gap up and you can maybe make a little profit. Selling strategy. When cutting losses, I cut my losses at the previous swing low or when trade thesis is invalidated. My trade thesis is invalidated, I mean my Elliott count is invalidated. Because we have three golden rules of Elliott that are unbreakable. And when any of those rules are invalidated, I try my best to get out at a good price and then reassess from there. Or take prof when I'm taking profits, normally when selling to strength, RSI bear dip at resistance, or when I see that price is losing momentum as it's approaching resistance and a failure swing. And also if I see Siguro a pattern breakdown at the top at resistance, then that's when I'm gonna take my profits. Risk management, 2% VAR cut. I know it's a little bit more aggressive. It's more aggressive than what they would recommend, uh, 1%. But since I was really playing to win the competition, I made it 2%. <laughs> uh, my biggest trade for the competition was KPPI. My main bias. My, the main reason why I chose KPPI is because of its, number one, its volatility. And my main bias for KPPI was that it had just finished its two. And I bought it, I bought it over here, right? After an A, B, C down and within the C, I noticed that it had a one, two, three, four, five to complete the C. And then over here, I was looking for a bull dip already. Because at that point, after the A, B, C, I was expecting that the next move up would either be a 1, 2, or maybe another A, B, C, right? So this is how I entered. After the 1, 2, 3, 4, after the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, to complete the C, I started looking for a bull dip over here, bull dip on the 30-minute chart. There was an uptick here, and when it broke above that neckline intraday, I bought my first position, half position at 904. I think that was 16,000, 15,000 worth. And once it confirmed that it was it was hovering above the V bands, this is the simple moving average standard deviation. 
once it confirmed that it was hovering above the B bands, I got it again at support 9.24 for my final position. And when it went up, I sold it at 12, 12.66, I think. 12.66. Over here, you see this, gre this small dick. This is where I got out. I know that I wasn't able to sell here, but what I saw was that there was a bull div intraday and a failure swing when my count was that it was already mature. Wave 5 of 3, I think, was the count. So once I saw that bull dip intraday and failure swing, I got out of I got out of my position. I sorry, bear dip, bear dip. So my second, my second position in KPPI. So take note that the main bias for this, I was really hoping that it was already in wave three. Right? Over here, I was already hoping that this was a one two of the three, or since too good to be true, na, it, it, that, that it's gonna break the high. Maybe a one, two, three, four, five to complete the one of the three. That was what I was thinking. So over here, since I saw this move, I automatically thought that the next pullback could be bought. And I entered I entered over here when I saw this because I thought I was really aggressive. The reason why I was aggressive because I thought it would be wave three, right? And when I saw this one move one and when it broke above this high, paused for a while, I bought it there. But to be honest with you, KPPI is my biggest trade. That was my biggest trade for the competition. But if I'm going to be honest, I know that it was still a bad trade. It was still a bad trade because I bought it here and my cut should have been here. So I should have been so I should have stopped out over here and then re-entered. Here the reason why I didn't cut my loss. The reason was because my bias was so strong. And my bias was so strong because of this previous move. This one. Because this move was a nine wave move intraday. One, two, three, I think here somewhere. Four, five. What's that? One, two, and then count here to complete the three. And then eight to complete the four, and then nine over since this is a nine wave move intraday coming from a swing low, since it was a nine wave move intraday coming from a swing low, uh, I thought that it was impulsive. And about in Elliot, you have either a one, two, three, four, five, wherein the one, the three, and the five are impulsive, and then A, B, C, wherein the A and the C also subdivide into its own five wave or nine wave move. And since it was coming from that swing low, I thought that after this, since it was coming from here, this could either be a 1, 2, or an A, B, right? And whether or not, and whether it's a 1, 2, or an A, B, based on Elliott guidelines, you are still due for at least another leg up. At least a 3, 4, 5, or at least a C. So that's, 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 why, that's why I couldn't cut. <laughs> KBPI, I went up to 15, 15 plus, and I was able to exit my position at 15.02. And I exited there because my count, my primary count, my hope was that it was at wave three. Right? And we know that wave three usually ends up at 1.618. But wave five of three, wave five of the inner wave three, ends usually at the 1 to 1.272 extension of of the first wave. And this is around the 1 to 1.272 extension of this area. So my bias was that I was selling the wave 5 of 3 at the 1.1 to 1.272 extension. I did identified that area as a resistance level and this is what I saw in order for me to sell. As price was approaching that area, as price was approaching that resistance level, what I saw was that momentum was falling. The demand for the stock, evidenced by volume over here, was also falling. And with that, once once it reached 15, the 15 area, it looked like, and this one I wasn't sure, so I actually asked, I messaged Ken and asked him if this was a terminal diagonal. Because it looked like a rising wedge or a terminal diagonal in Elliott. And once I saw that slowdown momentum, weakening volume, 
terminal diagonal heading into resistance. I sold, not here, but here during this week because I thought it was going to break, break down of this pattern. That's how I exited my KPPI trade. But take note that my main bias was that I was selling 5 of 3. So that means that the move wasn't over yet. That you can still buy the 4 in order to sell the 5. So over here, when I saw a falling wedge, when I saw this falling wedge, it uptick, it broke above the pattern. I bought my first position here. It was also a bull div intraday. And I bought the rest of my position when it looked like it was going to confirm my bias. In order for me to sell more than 15, maybe 17, for the end of wave 3. Pero, um, my bias was wrong. That ended up being a whole seat. And this ended up being part of the correction. Di na umabot sa 17, 18. And when it got here, I got my loss. Or a small, small loss. That was my KPPI trade. My next biggest trade in the competition was ASX. So the main bias for buying ASX was that I was in the four, wave four, and I was trying to capture the fifth wave up. We were after a one, two, three, four, because after a one, two, three, four, I was trying to get the stock here so I could sell once it broke the high of the three. And I thought that it was in wave three, a uh, wave four, because peak RSI happened here. Peak RSI happened here, wave three of three, wave four of three, wave five, five of three to complete the bull div. And after the first, after the first pullback, not the first pullback, but when it pulled back, pulled back to the 50 period moving average. And that's where I got my first position. And I sold it over here. I think there was a bull div intraday. And I re-entered here in the consolidation because just like KPPI was a nine wave move on the intraday charts. This is also a nine wave move intraday. I wasn't able to show it here, but then this is a nine wave move intraday. So my bias was that the next pullback could still be bought. So I entered my position here and was able to exit, I think around 12.7, somewhere here. Because I was, I was really paying attention to ASX because of this bull div. This bull div indicated that ASX was losing momentum as it was approaching the previous high resistance. Be sorry, bear div as it was approaching previous high resistance. And when there was a failure swing here, failure swing broke down. I sold at this wick. I sold at this wick. I wasn't able to ride the full move to 14, but it was enough for it was enough for the for the trade. My next gain was Sun. My main bias for buying Sun was that I was still, that we were still within the three. And that I was trying to sell um, to grow the high of the three. So I bought Sun. How did I buy Sun? I counted this as a one, two, three. And then it formed a DCS in the four. Broke above the channel, like E3 here. And that's where I entered my first position. Put my cut below 1.6, below the previous swing low. And then what happened to Sun? But well, there was a trading halt and then the next day, and then a few days after, gap up because of the news. It was a 16%, 15% move. And I wasn't able to sell the peak, mainly because, uh, when, and this is where trading psychology comes in, maybe beca mainly because of hope. I was hoping that it would go up 20, 25% before it would, would peak out, and that's, where I wanted to sell, maybe above two. And since I was hoping for a bigger move, I didn't sell there. And when it broke down and showed me that it was really reacting to that resistance level, I sold it at 1.75. And I also traded intraday the bounce on the five minute chart here, sold here. And yeah, it's my sun trade. So, Actually, I started the competition really slow. In the first week of the competition, I was already down. And this is a screenshot that says 91,000. Pero I think the low of my portfolio was at around 86,000 during the start of the competition, first two weeks. I had several VAR violations, 2,600 plus, and a lot of other losses that compounded, mainly because I was very aggressive trying to win. 
that's what happened. Down to 86,000. But then fortunately, with the KPPI trade, ASX, Sun, uh, I was able to regain my portfolio and slowly get into the top 10. And this is my, this was around two months into the competition. I think around November. And this is my equity curve at that point of the competition. Edge ratio, 2.54. Total trades taken in two months, 20, about 20. I held every trade for about six days and had a hit ratio of 50%. And I think with the presentation that was, with Ken's presentation last year's outliers, he said na above Two edge ratio is sustainable trading. And this was Siguro on the first week, the first week that I was in the top 10. And then this is where your trading psychology really comes in. Because when I got into the top 10, I really felt the pressure to make money every day. Because I didn't want my I, I didn't want to see my rank go down. I didn't want to lose any money. And I was really forcing myself to find a way to trade so that I could inch up on my portfolio especially given that especially given that there were really not many opportunities at that time and there was a very small lead i had a very small lead so it was it would be very easy for anyone to just overtake and this is what happened to my portfolio after i went from taking 20 trades in 2 months to trade to taking about 40 trades in 1 month and the market condition was really bearish. This was December, wherein it would be even recommended to cut down on your trading. I quadrupled on it because I was pressured to make money since I didn't want to see my rank go down. Edge ratio, one is to one. And trade length from holding the trade for six days on average to holding it, to holding every trade for one day. Because the lead was very small and I was really pressure to make money. I asked myself that if this is going to be a game of inches, because I, th I think you guys have noticed that top 6 to 10, there was a very small lead between all of them, between all of us. Uh, I think on the second to the last day, everyone from 6 to 10 was at 16, 16.7, 16.5, 16.3, 16.1. It would be very easy for anyone to overtake. And I think even up until the last hour of the competition, number 11 took over number 10. So I was always asking myself, na, if this is going to be a game of inches, where am I going to get that inch? Where am I going to get that small percent, 1%, 2% where I can um, stay in the top 10? And I thought that I would be able to get that inch trading MOCs or mark on close. So every MOC I, I saw, even without context, even without any proper bias, I bought. Because the, the, the logic of buying MOC is that you buy it since it's forced down 320, next day gap up, you'll be able to take 1%, 2%. And it, you know, if, you're, if your reward is 1%, 2%, that's more or less 1 is to 1, including commissions. Right? Or even, even, what do you call this? even less than 1 is to 1. So that's what I did, and I thought I could fly blindly buy MOCs and maybe get 2-3% addition on the portfolio. What ended, up ha what ended up happening was my portfolio slowly went down and down with those MOCs. URC, MEG, GTCAP, Ali, and a lot, of, a lot more that I didn't include. But that was the reason. And then after that, I think two weeks left in the competition, I was at rank 11. Trading MOCs, trading these, and also trying, constantly trying to force the bounce. Since my bias for ASX was that it was a 5, I thought that I could be able to trade a B, a B bounce. So that's what happened here. Buy, within the day cut, buy again here, within the day cut, buy again here, within the day cut, within the next day cut. Trying to force the bounce, trying to make sure na, that um, I don't, that I don't fall into the lower ranks. I ended up being rank 11. And good good thing that on, on the last two weeks, there was a lot of, not a good thing, but there were opportunities that I was able to take advantage of in the last two weeks of the trading cup. I was able to identify a trade in MPI. So what happened in MPI 
was that it broke down for several days, waterfall. And on this last day, I chose to buy it at the end of the day. Because, primarily because of that MOC. MPI was at 2.74 pre-close and it closed at 2.69. And what's different with MPI and with all the other MOCs is that at the end of the day, there were a lot of people na sumasalo sa MPI. There was a lot of bids. There were a lot of buyers at that area. So that's what I did. I got my first position at the end of the day over here. And when it got up the next day to confirm my bias, I bought it, I think, after the week, after this week when it went up. And sold it over here. Now I know that I was only able to get a very small amount of profit. And that's really something that I have to improve in my trading. Because MPI came from 4, went all the way down to 2. But if it does that, you should expect that when it bounces, it's not just going to give you 10%. It's not just going to give you 15%. It's going to give you maybe a bigger bounce, potentially. And that was my failure. Siguro also part of that is the trading psychology. Na I didn't want to give away any of my profits anymore. So I sold it over here. And the next trade... But at that time, um, everyone from Rans 6 to 10 was still very, very close. And anyone could still overtake. The next trade that I got to really not solidify, but then make sure that I don't fall down at top 10 is MWC. And to be honest, I don't have a primary long term count on MWC. But on the intraday chart, I tried to count it. Since I saw that the Oscillator extreme happened over here. I thought that this was the oscillator extreme happens at wave three of three. But this was the wave three of three going down here. When it when when it ticked up over here, this that this would be wave four of three, and to have a wave wave five of three to complete this first bull dip. The wave five of three, but I didn't pick it up pick it up yet because I thought that there would still be room to go down. But when it completed its wave four and there was a waterfall intraday. I think it was down around 40%, 41%. I saw, and I mean, I was immediately looking for a setup because my bias was that that, that waterfall was the fifth wave down. So I was immediately looking for a setup, and there was also a bold view. I was looking for a setup on the intraday chart. I went down to the one minute chart and saw that here at 5.04, ticked up first. First move, and I thought it would be wave one. There was a DCS on the one minute chart, A, B, C. It bounced, sucked as a channel. And I bought a very small position, 10,000 10, over here. Broke out of the channel and added on this pause here. And this is another thing in MWC that I really missed because I was able to enter it at you a good price. I was able to get it a good price. 504 first entry. Or 5.14 first entry. And just like MPI fell from 4 to 2, from 4.5 to 2.69, MWC fell from 18 down to 5 in two weeks. Diba? So when it bounces, I don't think you can just expect na it's only going to bounce 10%, 15%. That if, if it falls from 18 down to 5, you can expect a bigger bounce. But since I was really micro, it was I think there was a breakdown. I saw this as a breakdown and I sold over here. That wasn't I sold over there, but then the competition wasn't over, so I looked to buy back MWC. Next day it gapped up. And I saw this as a three. I saw this as a three. It formed a DCS, what I thought was a DCS. Broke out of the channel, had an E3 here, and then since Mali yung count ko. It broke below the previous swing low. I cut my position here. And then I realized that maybe MWC was forming a bigger DCS. So this is my first buy. Then after a while, I realized that um, maybe I plotted the channel wrongly. So I redrew the channel here, broke out, paused for a while, bought two positions here, very small position, 6,000, um, and then sold here. When I thought it was going to break down. Not knowing what would happen after. Because I thought 
was, I think, two days left, three days left in the competition, and I didn't want to take any loss. Because, again, the lead was very small. Seven was 16 point, I think top, top six was 16.7, then 16.5, 16.1. The lead was very small, and any small, this, any small loss that you had on your portfolio could really affect your rank. So I got it here, I sold it at 245, and at the end of the day, I realized that it was forming a triangle here. So I bought um, a partial of my position at the end of the day again. And on the next day, gap up, retested the, the triangle, retested triangle resistance, and then I added my position on the follow through higher. And then I added Siguro another 5,000 here after this four. And when I noticed that so I saw this as a three, right? And I noticed, I thought that this would be a five. And when I noticed that it was forming what looked like to me a falling wedge, a rising wedge, I sold my position when it broke down. That was my last trade for the competition. This is my equity curve and this is my equity curve and the competition. Edge ratio, 1.9. Total trades taken, 60. Average holding length about three days in a 44% hit ratio. Um, not to be too micro, not to be too micro because there are a lot of bear divs, there are a lot of bull divs, there are a lot of breakdowns that happen on the minute charts. But a breakdown on a one minute chart, three minute chart is just a small pullback on the 30 minute chart, on the one hour chart, even the daily chart. But, because I was able to enter MWC MPI at good prices but wasn't able to hold for the full move because on the breakdown on the one minute chart, I sold my position already. That's one of the lessons that I learned. To not to be too micro and to always look at the bigger picture. So, I leave you with that. Thank you.